Well, I want to talk a little bit about evaporation and precipitation. Evaporation and precipitation are the kinds of things that we kind of take for granted that we know, we kind of think about, uh, we know what happens when a puddle disappears or a spilled water on a, on a floor evaporates. We know what happens when it rains, but there's some misconceptions centered around that, and I want to clear some of those up and, and probably make you aware of something you were never aware of before. First of all, some people think that just because it's warmer, that rates of evaporation are higher, but this really isn't necessarily so. If you think about when you're in a place like Florida, you just walk off a plane in Florida, walk out of a building in Florida, immediately you start sweating. Well, you're sweating because it's so humid, you can't evaporate sweat off of your skin. Rates of evaporation in extremely humid environments are actually quite low because the atmosphere is, in some sense, already saturated with water vapor. By the same token, if you go to somewhere like the, um, like up in the mountains where it's nice and cold, you can actually evaporate and lose water very quickly because it's very dry in that air. So temperature isn't always the, the only indicator of rates of evaporation, and that's something to keep in mind and something we'll focus on right here. The real factor that we really want to pay attention to is something called vapor pressure. It's really the pressure of water vapor. It's some expression of the amount of water vapor, if we can loosely use that term, above a liquid that's been evaporated. <clears throat> As it turns out, when molecules of a liquid gain enough energy, and remember, we talked about how much energy it takes to convert liquid water to a gas, that's the latent heat of vaporization. So when, the, when a, a group of molecules, if we can think about it that way, gain that 540 calories of energy, or whatever it is, um, depending on what their temperature is, if it's a little bit lower than 100 degrees, then it might be 590 or 500 or 600 calories of energy to turn those water molecules that are liquid into a gas. When it gains that energy, then they evaporate. That's the process of evaporation. On the same token, when those gas molecules lose 540 calories of energy or more, they condense and become a liquid. That's what we call precipitation or sometimes also called condensation. And that's the process of condensation. Well, precipitation and condensation are occurring simultaneously over a, any kind of liquid. And they actually reach a balance. And the balance that they reach the rates of precipitation and the rates of evaporation, the balance between those two determines the vapor pressure for that particular temperature and actually atmospheric pressure as well. So as temperature goes up, we get more evaporation, but we also get more condensation. We get more vapor pressure as well. As temperature goes down, rates of precipitation or condensation and evaporation are lower and the vapor pressure is also lower. But this is not a linear relationship, it's actually a curvilinear relationship. And that's what we see in a figure that we'll show you in just a few minutes. But let's use this example first, figure eight, six in the book. Here's what I just told you about. At lower temperatures, rates of evaporation and condensation, of course, when they're in equilibrium, we have fairly low rates of both, and we have a low vapor pressure, in this case shown here, of about 12 millibars. As we raise temperature, we raise rates of evaporation. Again, these water molecules are gaining more heat, gaining that latent heat of evaporation and evaporating faster, but at the same time, the water molecules that are a gas over the liquid are also losing that heat, and this is in a closed box, and, and con condensing Okay, at the same faster rate, but we have a higher vapor pressure and even higher temperatures, an even higher vapor pressure. This point where the two, where the rate of evaporation and condensation are equal or in an equilibrium is called the equilibrium vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure goes up as temperature goes up, but it doesn't do so in a linear way. And we'll see that in just a minute here. <clears throat> So as temperature rises, the equilibrium vapor pressure 
rises as well. And if you're a little bit confused, just hang on just a second because I think this will help you understand it. What this means then is this sort of amount of water that the atmosphere can hold, and that's the really wrong way to say it because the atmosphere doesn't hold water, it doesn't dissolve water. You could have water vapor in a vacuum, but most of us are used to hearing it that way and it kind of makes some sense to us if we say it that way. So the true scientists out there will have to excuse me for a moment, but in a sense, what we're saying is that this is how much water the atmosphere, how much water vapor the atmosphere can hold for a given temperature. Truthfully, it's the vapor pressure for a given temperature, okay? If we're below the equilibrium vapor pressure, then we have drier air. We have air that's undersaturated with respect to the amount of water that it could hold. And so rates of evaporation are going to be faster to try to reach that equilibrium. This is a condition when it's very dry in Southern California, your skin just cracks up and uh, low rates of humidity dry out the, the brush and we have fires during those periods of time. It's the same condition, again, this undersaturated when it's very cold and you're up in the mountains and the air is very dry. Rates of evaporation are faster, okay, because that's how we reach this equilibrium vapor pressure. On the other hand, if the existing vapor pressure is higher than the equilibrium vapor pressure, then we're super saturated. Those are conditions where it's like Seattle, where it's basically like living in a fishbowl full of water when you live in Seattle. There's so much rain and, and condensation coming out of the air. The air is super saturated with water vapor and it's just wet and sticky. I'm sure many of you have lived in places like that. Even Florida too sometimes. It's almost at the equilibrium vapor pressure. That's what we call saturated. That would be a condition of 100% humidity. And if you take a meteorology class like Rick Dickert and I teach, you can learn more about humidity and, and those kinds of processes in the atmosphere. For our purposes here in this oceanography class, I just want to impress upon you the conditions by which we get more evaporation or get more precipitation and also ask you to think about the heat that goes with that evaporation and the heat that, that's released as a result of that condensation or precipitation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. All right, so this is kind of an important graph. And if you can understand this graph, then you can perfectly understand the principles of evaporation and precipitation.